Hello, my name is Alex Benitez and I'm the director of Mountville Archaeological Park. Welcome to one of the Southeast's most important Native American cultural heritage sites. Now known as Mountville, the ancient city behind me was once a major Mississippian cultural metropolis. At its height around 800 years ago, the city had more than two dozen platform mounds of various heights surrounding this vast open area that we call a plaza. On top of the mounds and in the plaza, hundreds of structures were built as residences, work areas, play areas, craft working spaces, and places for performing important rituals and politics. Everyday life for thousands of Mississippian Malibu residents occurred right here. But archeologists also believe that much of this everyday life supported a grander goal. Malva was a special place. It was a connection to the afterlife, a portal to the next world. Today we preserve and celebrate the city's past and its importance to many Native American people who consider Malville a homeland. Historically, central Alabama was home to Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Cherokee peoples. Many tribal members return to Malville every year on special visits and during our fall celebration of Southeastern Native American cultures. Today, Moundville is protected as part of Moundville Archaeological Park, a unit of the University of Alabama Museums. It has been designated a National Historic Landmark, and it is also listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Established in the 1930s as Mound State Monument, with the aid of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the park opened its original museum to the public in 1939. Over the past 80 years, much has changed in the park, but the mounds and interest in Mississippian past remain. Everybody and welcome to the virtual component of Bird Fest. My name is Lindsay Gordon and I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator at Moundville Archaeological Park. And thank you for joining us. Today, our special guest is Meg Ford and she is the Black Belt Coordinator at the Alabama Audubon. Hi, Meg. And hey, thank Lindsay. you for thank you for joining us. Oh, Just, thank you so much for having me. Just as a reminder, while we're broadcasting, feel free to leave a comment. And also as another reminder, this is live. So if anything shall happen, just hang in there with us. So Meg, what are you gonna to talk to us about today? So I am Alabama Audubon's Black Belt Coordinator. Um, I work in our Black Belt office in Greensboro, Alabama that we just opened in October. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our Black Belt Bring Initiative and why we decided to open our new office in Greensboro. So, um, I guess I could, could I say a little bit about Alabama Audubon in general really quickly? Of course, please do. Great, so um, Alabama Audubon is Alabama's state leader in bird conservation and research and the shared knowledge of our native bird populations. So we were founded as Birmingham Audubon. So if you're familiar with that name, we're the same organization, but we uh, rebranded to Alabama Audubon in 2019 to reflect our reach across the state. So we have our original office in Birmingham. Um, by the way, we're 75 years old this year. So our office in Birmingham is 75 years old and our group in Birmingham is 75. And then in 2017, we opened our coastal office in Mobile. And just last year, we opened up our Black Belt office to offer um, field trip opportunities throughout Alabama that revolve around birding and to also research all of our native birds across the state of Alabama. Such a biodiverse state. Awesome. I need to, I'm trying to get into birding. We've talked about this before and Dwight did a birding uh, tour for us this morning. Um, so I'm interested in learning more about birding in the black bill. <laughs> oh, awesome. Perfect. <laughs> All about it. Definitely. <laughs> well, awesome. So let's get started if you want um, with birding in the black belt. And again, thank you so much for being here. Of course. Thanks again for having me. So um, if the, is the PowerPoint shared, Lindsay? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started then. So first, before I talk about the specific projects that we're doing in the Black Belt and in our Black Belt office, I wanted to talk about some upcoming opportunities that we have um, throughout our offices in the state of Alabama. So first I wanted to talk a little bit about our outreach efforts. So burning is of course, especially for me, burning is an opportunity to be with one another and to spend some time outside with your friends and family and to connect with one another over the beautiful birds that we have in our state. And unfortunately, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we haven't been able to have any in-person programs since March of last year. But um, on the bright side of that, we've been having a lot of really great success with doing online programming in the past year. So I wanted to share a few online offerings that we have coming up. 
Um, the first one is our spring Audubon talk with our coastal biologist, Sabrina Cobb. She's on our mobile staff and she's gonna be talking about birds of the coast and how they're impacted by climate change. And that's gonna be on April 22nd at 6 p.m. Another upcoming program that we have is a bird journaling demo with Timothy Joe. I'm gonna be talking a lot more about Timothy and his wonderful family um, throughout this presentation because he's located in the Black Belt. But Timothy is a visual artist. He does oil painting and he also works with uh, pastels as well. And he's gonna be doing what I think, what I understand is gonna be kind of a Bob Ross a painting tutorial with uh, learning how to do uh, nature journaling and um, art activities outside. That sounds so, cool. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Tim is such a great person and he's a great teacher. I've gotten to um, watch him work a couple of times and he's just a wonderful artist too. So that's going to be a great offering for us on April 26th at 6 p.m. And then the last one that we've got scheduled for right now is a birding by habitat class with Greg Harbour. That's gonna be a four week series in the um, month of June from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Mondays. And if you know Greg, you know that he's an amazing birder. Um, he's just a wealth of knowledge about birding throughout the state of Alabama and birding in general. And I know that this is gonna be a really wonderful class offering. Greg's class is a paid series. So you can sign up for that at alaudubon.org slash events. And the other two are free, but you have to pre-register for them. So you can also register for those at alaudubon.com slash events. And normally, like I said, we would be doing in-person field trips because of course, um, being able to experience the wonderful outdoors of Alabama and being able to see these birds in person is a lot better than being able to see them like online um, necessarily. But we're actually going to be opening up a very limited, very small field trip opportunity in the Birmingham area very soon. So if you're interested in learning about that and being involved with that, you can email our programs assistant, Teresa Rumor at Teresa at alaudubon.org. Once again, these are gonna be small groups. Um, I think we're planning on doing people, a group of people 15 and under for each one so that we can still socially distance and um, still be COVID safe while we're doing these field trips. But those will be our first field trips since March. So that's really exciting. Um, once again, you can email Teresa at alaudubon.org to learn about those. We also, in addition to doing um, in-person programming and online programming, have an incredible conservation team. Um, as someone that uh, birds recreationally and likes to be outside recreationally, our, I think our conservation staff is just magical and our superheroes. <laughs> They're doing a lot of incredible work um, researching the bird populations across the state of Alabama, learning really important information about their conservation needs and their habitat needs, and being able to report those things on a national scale, which I just think, once again, is just incredible. One opportunity that we just announced is that we are opening up a heron um, monitoring program. This is going to be a community conservation, a community research opportunity. So if you're interested in helping us spot any green herons or um, yellow crown night herons that are in your area, you can go to alaudubon.org slash herons to help us report where you saw them and when you saw them. Or if you're just interested in learning more about those two species, you can go to that page as well. And what I have pictured here are um, juvenile green herons that I believe were banded at the Birmingham Zoo last year. So this, uh, this uh, community science opportunity isn't gonna involve banding, it's just going to be monitoring them and uh, showing us where you've seen them. But this is another component of this research project. We've been banding green herons and monitoring their, um, their uh, migration patterns. And normally around this time of the year, we have a spring bird count. This year, once again, because of the pandemic, we're not gonna do that in person this year, but we are gonna encourage everyone, if you would like to participate in the spring bird count, to do that in your own backyard and your own home. So you can go to alaudubon.org slash events and check out our 2021 spring bird count event to find out how you can participate and uh, report the birds that you see in your living spaces. Okay, so that was a little bit about what we're doing in general. So I wanna talk a little bit more about why we started this office in the Black Belt. 
Um, the Black Belt is a unique area ecologically, and um, it's also got a lot of really wonderful, rich history that I really love to dive into and that I've loved learning a little bit more about since moving to Greensboro. But to kind of give you a full context for why we decided to build our new office in Greensboro in particular, I'm going to go way back. We're going to do a little bit of history. So let's start off with talking about how the Black Belt became, came to be, how it was formed. So Alabama's Black Belt is a part of a greater southeastern Black Belt region. If you can look on this U.S. map, the red portion of that marks out where the greater Black Belt region is across the southeast U.S. And as you can see, it just kind of follows the curvature of this portion of the U.S., but leaves out the coast for the most part, and a little bit of extra once you get down to parts like um, Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama. This uh, shape gives you a little bit of an indication of how this area came to be. So the defining feature of the Black Belt is that it has rich, fertile topsoil. So historically, these areas across the southeastern U.S. have had um, large agriculture economies and um, really relied on farmers and people that raise livestock um, to, uh, to bolster their economies. So the reason that this topsoil is this rich, as it turns out, is that during the Cretaceous period, this area of the U.S. and this area of Alabama in particular was underwater. So it was covered in a warm, shallow sea. And um, as a matter of fact, if you were to, for instance, my folks in the north, if you want to come down here and go birding, you can swing by the Natural History Museum first and go see some really cool fossils that are actually from Hale County, where our new office is. And all of those fossils are actually sea creatures. Um, some of them are quite big, like surprisingly large, um, but a lot of them are very small and would have had exoskeletons and shells around them. So when those sea creatures died, their skeletal remains would stay around for a little bit longer and they were eventually compressed into large chalk formations. So this chalk is actually the reason that the soil of the Black Belt is so fertile. It's one of the contributing factors to why things grow here so well and why the ecology of this area is so diverse and so unique. There are remnants of this chalk formation that you can see today. Um, there's a famous one that was studied called the Selma Group because it was found in Selma, interestingly enough. And you can actually see um, outcrops of the Selma group on the Alabama River. Like if you go to Selma and you go um, take a little walk on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you can actually see some of these outcrops in person. There's also a really famous one in Demopolis called White Bluff that's along the Tom Bigby River. And that's, a, that's actually a really important area for the Demopolis city because that's where a lot of their um, big events happen. So like Christmas on the River, there's a big portion of it that happens along White Bluff. So all that is to say that this remnant, this, um, this shape of the Southeastern Black Belt region is actually the lingering shoreline of this warm shallow sea that was around during the Cretaceous period. And the reason that this chalk was formed and the reason that the soil in this area is so fertile. So the great news about that is that the ecology here is incredible. Um, if we're talking about birds in particular, I can say that there are birds here that you can't see in other parts of the state. There are birds here that you might have a harder time finding in other places that you can see for a longer period of time here. And all of that is because of the unique ecology of the Black Belt. There's unique um, rock formations, there are unique plant life, there's unique trees. Um, and I've just been having a really fun time <laughs> getting to know this place. I just moved down here in October. so. Um, I'm coming up on the portion where I'm going to be able to see like cool wildflowers really soon. I'm going to be able to see even more birds that I've not seen before. My birding list has grown very large <laughs> since moving here and it's really exciting. So the defining feature or the defining habitat of the Black Belt is the Black Belt Prairie Habitat, which I have a picture of here. Um, it is a it's a habitat that's defined with a pretty unique um, flat landscape with lots of native grasses and lots of native cone flowers. So like big blue stem is all about, and um, like I said, lots of cone flowers as well. So the insects that like to live in these habitats also happen to be the insects that birds of this area like to eat. 
The black belt prairie habitat is actually slowly disappearing, unfortunately, because of just habitat loss and development and things like that. But something interesting that I've learned since moving here is that the farms of this area have actually taken on in many ways the roles, the habitat roles that the black belt prairie habitat has. So many of the insects that would have been living in the black belt prairie habitat, some of them have moved to farmland instead, which is pretty interesting. So some other uh, geological features of the black belt would be our oak, hick the oak hickory and pine forest. So there's a big swath of the Talladega National Forest that's involved in the um, black belt area. And also throughout the Black Belt, and especially in Hill County, um, the, catf the catfish industry is a pretty big thing. There are lots of catfish ponds around. Um, and that's, from what I understand, a pretty new thing. Like the catfish boom didn't really come about until the 1970s or so. But that's also, luckily for us birders, <laughs> has brought in a lot of really cool birds that you can see. So lots of wading birds, like great blue herons and anhingas. Um, but also uh, bald eagles. There are lots of bald eagles in this area as well. And I've, every time that I've seen one, I've seen one at a catfish pond. So that's interesting. So all of these different habitat features come together to make a really unique birding experience if you come and visit the Black Belt. So we've got, like I said, in hingas, we've got king rails, we've got um, painted buntings and indigo buntings, scissor tail flycatchers, Bald eagles, like I said, I'd never seen a bald eagle in real life until I came here and saw one in real life. So if you come here, you have a great opportunity to go visit all these different habitats and hopefully go see a lot of different birds at the same time. Now, this is the part of working in the Black Belt that is a little bittersweet for me because the land of this area has afforded us this opportunity to see really unique wildlife, um, maybe even take one trip and see a lot of different types of unique wildlife in one visit. But the other side of it is that it's also caused a lot of social unrest and a lot of harm and um, pain for a lot of communities of the Black Belt. So for instance, um, cotton was something that grew here very easily. So the Black Belt was the heart of slave economy in Alabama. The statistic that I've read was that up to 40% of all of the slaves in our state were concentrated here in the Black Belt, just in this little strip of land right in the middle of Alabama. And it's also worth noting, I think, especially because of this talk being with Moundville, um, the cotton industry across the Black Belt in general, like the greater Black Belt region, not just in Alabama, was a primary cause for forced removal of indig indigenous communities. And just to give you a little bit of perspective on how important and how impactful the cotton industry was for Alabama at this time, um, the original capital of Alabama was this area called Old Cahaba. So Old Cahaba is now a ghost town, but it's also an archeological park now that you can go visit. Um, and the reason that the capital was originally there was because of one, its proximity in the Black Belt, and two, because of its location near the Alabama River. And the only reason that it was moved from Old Cahaba to Montgomery was because, once again, Montgomery is an area in the Black Belt, had great proximity to the lucrative cotton um, industry, also had proximity to the Alabama River, but then also it was the original capital of the Confederate States of America just to give you a little bit of context for how important the cotton industry was and how impactful it was for our um, social history. So following the emancipation of slaves in 1862, um, a lot of, you're probably familiar with the term, the Great Migration. That was the event of many people from the South moving to the North to find new lives after they were freed. But there were lots of of uh, freed slaves that chose to stay here in the South and to stay here in the Black Belt in Alabama. And I would imagine that a lot of those people were thinking, you know, they've got great farming skills, but now they're gonna be able to apply them for themselves and work for themselves and get a little slice of this lucrative business that uh, so many white people were getting a lot of money from. Unfortunately, that as we know now, wasn't the case. So there were two from what I can tell main causes for that. One was the boll weevil infestation of 1910. 
Um, boll weevils infested the black belt and areas all across the South that were growing cotton and just decimated cotton, um, decimated the cotton industry and uh, cotton crops. Because the boll weevil is an insect that pretty much eats every part of the cotton plant from what I understand. And um, a lot of, for a lot of farmers, their reaction to the boll weevil infestation, unfortunately, was to grow more cotton, like grow twice as much cotton. Well, that caused twice as many boll weevils to come in and just completely decimated their, the cotton economy in that way. The other side of it that I think we're all familiar with is that even if you were an emancipated slave, you had all of these roadblocks that were keeping you from being as successful as you could be. So for one, um, white dominance was still really prevalent in um, the Alabama government, you know, the state government and local governments well after the emancipation of slavery. And it was hard to get people of color into office to represent our black communities and our communities of color in the black belt because it was really difficult to vote. There are all of these roadblocks to keep people from registering, the registration tests, um, as we now have evidence of, were had crazy questions on them that were impossible to answer at times or required really specific knowledge of law in order to answer. So all of these things together really kept um, black farmers in particular, even after the emancipation of slavery from being able to live their best lives. And, you know, I just think that that's something that's important to note because when we're talking about um, the wildlife of the Black Belt and the, um, the ecology of the Black Belt and the ecological communities that are here, we're also talking about places that were um, uplifted and taken care of by emancipated slaves and not free slaves as well. But the really great thing that I love to highlight about the Black Belt is that through all of this pain and all of this strife, a lot of really great things happened um, that impacted the nation as a whole for the civil rights movement and for the advancement of people of color in general. So one that's really famous is the Selma to Montgomery marches. Um, those were sparked by the death of Jimmy Lee Jackson in um, Marion, Alabama, which is just a, like a 20 minute drive away from me. Um, he was killed by a white state trooper during a peaceful protest. And the Selma to Montgomery marches were actually organized in direct response to his death. Um, the very first one is probably the most well-known one. It's called Bloody Sunday. Um, the peaceful protesters that participated in the Selma to Montgomery marches for the first one on Bloody Sunday were met by um, actual, actually state troopers that were called by the Alabama government to stop them. And um, it was very violent. Um, most famously, Senator um, John Lewis was involved with, the, with that first march, and all three of them actually. But he um, was injured in a way that uh, was permanent and visible until he passed away a few years ago. He had a scar on his head from it. So that was actually a big turning point for the civil rights movement on, on a whole, like nationally, because of the wide coverage that it got. A lot of people reported on it and it got the visibility of people in Washington. And because of that visibility, the people that uh, participated in the marches the next two times had a little bit more protection for being able to do them. And they were able to complete that march from Selma to, to Montgomery on the third attempt. Another person that emerged from all of this was Ralph Abernathy. He's actually from Marengo County, and he was highly considered to be Dr. Martin Luther King's right-hand man. So he helped him organize every march that he was involved with and was closely involved with all of the workings of the, um, of the civil rights movement that involved Martin Luther King. And following his death, he Ralph Abernathy actually completed the last few things and the last few marches that Martin Luther King had um, organized. And once again, Ralph Abernathy is from Marengo County, um, maybe like a 30 minute drive from where I am in Greensboro. 
The Tuskegee Airmen came about before all of this happened in um, 1965. So the Selma of Montgomery March happened in 1965. But I wanted to highlight the Tuskegee Airmen because they studied at T Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University, um, just outside of the Tuskegee area, once again in the Black Belt. And they were an all black group of um, fighter pilots and airmen that fought in World War II. And uh, a small group of them were actually, as it turns out, the first group of all black fighter pilots to fly internationally. Pretty interesting. And then this one absolutely blew my mind <laughs> when I learned about this. I just was so shocked and I had no idea. So the Lowndes County Freedom Organization was a group of people that organized immediately before the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965, once again, to protest civil rights, um, voting rights for uh, black people in Lowndes County. Their symbol was adopted by the Black Panther Party. Um, so they were the first people to use the Black Panther as a symbol for black power and for as, as a symbol for um, the advancement of civil rights for black citizens. So it was adopted just a few years later by Huey P. Newton and the uh, Black Panther Party. So technically, the very first original iteration of the Black Panther Party is from Lowndes County. Pretty awesome. So those are just a few big, um, a few large um, contributions that the Black Belt has given to us nationally. But I also just wanna say that I'm still learning about this stuff. And I feel like every time that I dive in a little bit or ask someone a question from here that was here during the civil rights movement, I learn a little bit more. So those were just some really big ones, but I also just wanna highlight that there are a lot of smaller, less discussed stories as well that you can learn about while you're birding. So speaking of birding, all of these things together, I think are at the heart of our Black Belt Birding Initiative. Um, it's a really wonderful opportunity to be in this area, to have a root in this office, and to be able to share these stories while um, talking about the wonderful nature of this area and also taking people out birding. So Alabama Audubon's Black Belt Birding Initiative works to bring the economic and environmental benefits of bird-based ecotourism to one of the country's most economically challenged rural areas. The fact of the matter is that there are a lot of communities in this area that haven't recovered from that economic downfall that I was talking about earlier with the um, cotton industry. There are a lot of areas of this area that are still very economically challenged. So while we're here and while we are bringing people to this area to bird and while we're giving outreach to people that already live here around birding, we want to do the best that we can to uplift our local economies, support local businesses, and have a positive impact on the Black Belt as a whole. Because I think that we can really leverage our power and our um, wonderful membership base, hit any of our members that are watching, um, to just uplift the people that are here a bit more while we're celebrating the wonderful ecology and the wonderful wildlife that this place has to offer. So I wanted to start off um, with talking about some of the projects that we're doing here in the Black Belt with this amazing partnership that we've had for a few years now with the Joe Farm. So the Joe Farm is a Black Angus farm that's located in New Bern, Alabama. And um, they opened just a few years ago a ecotourism business on their farm called Connecting with Birds and Nature Tours, LLC. So you can go and visit the Joe Farm. Um, you can... Uh, Google, Google their website and you can get their contact information to set up a private tour. They also have big public tours seasonally. And you can go and support a local business uh, by going to go bird on their property. But at the same time, you're also going to support their Angus business at the same time. So they're just a really wonderful family. Timothy Joe, which I mentioned earlier, he's doing that um, art class for us in just a few weeks. He's a member of this family. Uh, over here on the left, we've got a picture of me and our executive director, Ansel Payne, and Chris Joe, who is um, my primary contact for the Joe Farm, um, standing next to their swift tower that they just installed. So this is a big birdhouse that's for chimney swifts. So it's shaped, shaped kind of like a chimney, like where um, a chimney swift might roost in the city. And uh, Chris is just really wonderful. He's doing so much to 
incorporate bird habitat into their Angus farming and is doing so much to uh, also reach just new audiences for birding. Like he's a really great personality. And I think he just has this really wonderful knack for getting people who maybe have never gone birding before, or maybe might be a little bit nervous about birding to just like relax and have fun and like have a really good time on their farm. So Chris is awesome. I'm actually gonna talk about him a little bit more later too. And then here on the right is Cornelius Joe. That's Chris's dad. Um, Cornelius is a retired ag teacher, but he also is the owner of the Joe farm. And uh, next to him is Dr. Drew Lanham, who is a who's an ornithology professor at Clemson University. So they're in this picture together because in 2019, uh, Alabama Audubon partnered with the Joe farm to have a big birding tour, a black belt birding tour at their farm. So as you can see, um, lots of people came from near and far to go to this thing. It was really great. Um, I unfortunately wasn't there for it. I've only been working with Audubon since July of last year, but I still talk to people that think about this tour fondly and talk about how people came from all over the US and out of state and drove from far away just to be able to support this local business and to be able to see some unique birds. So land partnerships like this are something that I am really interested in forming more of. You know, I want to be able to support landowners that want to either just increase bird habitat on their property or to be able to support them financially as well. You know, you don't have to go big like the Joe Farm has, but, you know, if you want to just support bird habitat, maybe learn about native plants that you that might be good to plant on your property or want to incorporate things like swift towers on your property. Let's talk. Perry Lakes Park was the first thing that I hopped in and did with Alabama Audubon. Um, Perry Lakes Park is a park in Marion, Alabama, which is in Perry County. Um, and it is a birding hotspot. You know, a lot like the Joe Farm, there are people that actually come from out of state to be able to go bird here because the birding opportunities are so unique. So um, this is a picture that I took on one of my first visits to Perry Lakes Park. I got to go canoeing in it. And um, so it's got a really great bald cypress swamp and um, a few oxbow lakes. It's also got a pebble beach um, that has easy access to the Cobber River so you can go swimming in it. And it's got a a lot of great uh, wooden structures that were built by a local organization that's actually local to New Bern called Auburn Rural Studio. So it's an offshoot of Auburn University um, for their architecture school. And the students there work on building affordable housing in the area. But specifically for Perry Lakes Park, they built a really cool burning tower, um, really cool restrooms, like really, really <laughs> interesting restrooms. <laughs> People always get confused when I'm like, the restrooms are so cool, but they are. <laughs> you just have to see them. Um, and they also built uh, easy access um, boardwalks that are low impact and also a uh, pavilion area. Um, However, the person, hmm? I was going to say we're familiar with um, Rural Studio here at the park because they are doing some projects for us too as well. So we love Rural Studio. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. Do you want to talk for a second about what they're doing at the park? Oh, they're actually, we actually did a Mountville Monday on it. So if everybody has time, you can go back and watch it. But they're with the ladies, but they are actually helping us build one of our pavilions in the campground for us. That's awesome. That's so cool. Okay, I'll have to check that out too, because I'm a big, I'm a huge fan of Rural Studio. They've already won my art. They're awesome. <laughs> yeah, they're, they seriously are awesome. I mean, they built the, um, they built the library in New Bern. They built a fire station in New Bern. Uh, New Bern did not mm -hmm. have a fire station until they built it. And um, like I said, they're doing the all these wonderful projects with building affordable housing, which I think is just so important for this area too. So they're awesome. Go check them out. Anyway. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. No. <laughs> no, I love like going on a tangent about like other people that are awesome. So um, they've done a lot of really great work at Perry Lakes Park as well. But the park right now is closed because of um, ongoing maintenance needs. So it's been closed since April of last year. And um, Perry County, unfortunately, um, just doesn't right now have the resources to um, fund ongoing maintenance. So like removing trees that have fallen down or um, power washing the boardwalks when they get a little grimy and they get slippery. 
things like that. So it's closed right now, unfortunately, but um, Alabama Audubon is has formed a coalition with, let's see, Auburn Rules Studio, Alabama Birding Trails, Cabo River Society, Alabama Birding Trails, I already said Alabama Birding Trails, I said them twice, and um, the Nature Conservancy in Alabama. And we're kind of doing what we can to organize volunteer work days where we can. Unfortunately, we have this pause right now until the pandemic's a little better, um, but we're also gonna be potentially working with the county to work on potential funding solutions and just doing what we can in order to get this park reopened. Because like I said, it's a really great draw for birders. People come from out of state to go birding here, but it's also just a free place to be. You know, if you're, if you're a person that lives in Marion or if you live in Perry County, this is a free place that you can go to safely get some time outside and like get some fresh air, stretch your legs a little bit, maybe have a little, picnic at the pavilion once it's fixed up. And I think it could just be a really great asset to the community. So we're working on that. After I moved here in October, we began um, the process of getting our new office opened up. So here are some pictures of it. I'm planning to have a visual tour of it, or excuse me, a virtual tour of it sometime in the near future. I'm working on getting one of our windows repaired so that I can um, yeah, so we can, you can see it in its full glory, <laughs> as, as you will. So um, look out for that on our social media pages coming up soon. But here is a little sneak peek of it. Our building that we uh, run our office in is actually a former Rosenwald school, which is so cool to me. Um, the Rosenwald schools are a series of about 5,000 schools that were built by Julius Rosenwald, who is a co-owner of Sears Roebuck and Booker T. Washington when he was president of Tuskegee University. And they built them in a direct response to um, underfunding during um, segregation of schools. So black schools in particular were being underfunded and just kind of being overlooked. So the Rosenwald schools were supposed to be a heightened education experience for kids of color so that you could get the same opportunities and get the same education that a white student might. So one of our, our offices in one of those schools, which is really cool. The outside of it that you can see on the left is exactly the way that it was built, but the inside of it has kind of been gutted and renovated. And um, now our office is in there. So we rent this office from HERO, that stands for the Hale, um, hang on, the Hale Economic Revitalization Organization. There you go. Um, that's an organization in, uh, based in Greensboro that works throughout Hale County to help with bill assistance. And they also provide affordable housing and affordable office spaces for people. So that's who our offices run it through. They also work out of here. Um, there's an Airbnb upstairs that uh, Hero also rents out to people and gets a little bit of extra revenue from. And I love to brag about this. The person that works next door to me is a baker. So it always smells amazing in here. <laughs> Her name's Abadir's Bakery. So she's in, um, she bakes uh, Egyptian influenced goods and she sells out of Selma once a week. And then she also sells at Aaron Sanders Head's art studio in Greensboro once a week as well. So I have great neighbors. I've got a beautiful space to work in and I'm just really grateful to be here. In November of last year, I got the opportunity to host a panel talk called Black Birders of the Deep South. Um, and this was a panel talk that we decided to put on um, in direct response to um, Black Birders Week in particular. I think Black Birders Week was really the inspiration for this. So Karina Newsom, who is the person on the right, far right that participated in this, she's the community the community engagement manager for Georgia Audubon. She was also a direct, um, she was also one of the primary organizers for Black Birders Week. So I was really happy to have her in on this panel talk because we were talking about the need for more diverse birding communities and specifically whether or not there were any needs for making Southern birding communities more diverse, if there are any special needs for that in particular. So that was just a really wonderful panel talk that I was super grateful to be a part of. And once again, it was one of the first things that I did here and it was just so inspirational to talk to all of these folks. So Karina participated, um, Dr. Drew Lanham, who we saw a picture of earlier, who's an ornithology professor at Clemson University also participated. 
Chris Joe um, of the Joe Farm and connecting with Birds and Nature Tours LLC also participated. Um, Dr. Rashida Farid is a um, wildlife ecologist. Oh gosh, she does so much. <laughs> She's a wildlife ecologist. She's an assistant professor at Tuskegee University. Um, she heads up Tuskegee University's Ornithology Club. Let's see, she works for the Extension Office in Tuskegee and it's just a really wonderful person to know. And she was one of the first people that I got to meet in this work too. So Dr. Farid is incredible as well. And then finally, Christian Cooper is a New York City Audubon board member, but you may know him as the person that had the police called on him when he was birding in um, Central Park. So he was also just a really wonderful addition to this panel talk. And um, I learned a lot about Central Park from him and learned a lot about the New York um, birding community through this talk um, from him. And so it was just a really, it was a really wonderful conversation. There were some people from the South that got to chime in and others that weren't from the South, but were interested in visiting the South that got to get some of their questions answered. And you can see this panel talk actually on our website at alaudubon.org slash black belt, if you want to see the recording of it. And finally, um, we haven't gotten any conservation research projects set in stone quite yet, but we are in the process of figuring out what those might be. And it's really exciting. You know, I've been saying this whole time that the ecology of the black belt is so unique and the birds here are so diverse that there are actually a lot of different directions that we could go in. So there's um, the potential for green heron monitoring and yellow crown night heron monitoring with our heron project. We also have a, swift watch program that we do throughout Alabama that could be um, implemented here potentially in the near future. But I mean, like I said, there are birds here that you can't see in any other part of the state. And the interesting thing is like, for instance, this picture that I have here is of a scissor tail flycatcher, very beautiful bird that's got a really beautiful long tail um, that is a pretty popular bird for people to see because it's just such a beautiful looking one. Um, if you were to look up the range map for one of these birds right now, like if you go to Google, it isn't even listed as being in Alabama at any part of the year, which is crazy. Like this is actually a picture from the Joe farm. So birds like this are here, but the research hasn't been done yet to nationally show and officially show that they are here. So getting into these conservation efforts and figuring out how we're gonna um, incorporate research into our work is something that I'm really excited to do and something that I think is gonna be really important for the birding community as a whole. So some other things that I've got coming up that I am kind of fleshing out but don't quite have um, available yet are our Birders Flock Here program. This is gonna be an effort for us to better support local businesses when people go birding here. So our dream is that it's gonna be kind of like a TripAdvisor situation. You, when you uh, wanna go birding, for instance, in Hale County, you can go to our website and click on our Birders Flock Here guide and find out where you can get some lodging to stay overnight in Hale County. You can find out where to go eat in Hale County, maybe find out some places that you can support, some local businesses that you can support while you're here, and then also get some a lot of different options for you to go birding in different habitats in the area. So once again, this is all a part of our effort to uplift local economies and um, have a bigger impact of more intentional impact than just coming here and bird and leaving. And also I've been working on this a lot lately. Um, we have a black belt birding festival that's coming up on August 7th. Now we're still deciding whether it's gonna be in person or digital. Um, I'm definitely going to have already talked to Lindsay about this. I'm going to be using this great program stream art yard that we're using right now if it's going to be digital, but hopefully the pandemic will break up a little bit and we'll have be comfortable with doing it in person because I want to bring lots of people here to go birding so I can see everybody and so that you can see how great the birding opportunities here are. And then also so that you can get some more opportunities to support local businesses through a vendor expo that we're going to be hosting during the festival. So keep an eye out for that. We should have an announcement coming up like about that, like I said, maybe towards the end of April or the beginning of May. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about some of the topics that I discussed today, I have just a few resources that have helped me as I've been moving and as I've been getting settled into this area. 
Southern Wonder is one of my OG favorite books. I used to read it all the time when I was learning about um, environmental education and things like that. It's a really excellent overview of the biodiversity of Alabama throughout. So not, not just Black Belt specific, but if you wanna get like a really good overview of how amazing Alabama's ecology and biodiversity is, you can check out that book by Scott Duncan, Southern Wonder. I've also been referencing this um, report by Claude Jenkins called The Ecology and Conservation of Black Belt Prairies quite a bit since I've been here. It's got a lot of great information on the history of Black Belt Prairies and their conservation needs. So if you want to read that one, I don't think it's available for free if you Google it, but I can give you Claude Jenkins' email and um, if you want to reach out to him and see how you can get a copy of it to read. If you wanna learn a little bit about black belt history, you should come down here. That's been my favorite way to learn about black belt history, to learn about, to learn about it from the people that were here and from the people that experienced it in person. So one really wonderful resource that I've had in Greensboro is the Safe House Black History Museum. It's maybe, um, if you come and visit the office, it's maybe like a five to 10 minute drive away. You can also check out the Greensboro Depot along the way. Um, but it's a museum that uh, has uh, relics from slavery and also from the civil rights movement in and around Greensboro and Hale County. And the house that it's in was actually a house that Martin Luther King took shelter in in 1967 to hide from the Ku Klux Klan, which is nuts. So very interesting place. Um, Teresa Davis, who's the director there, is a really wonderful person and a wealth of knowledge. Um, it's only open by appointment right now, though. So be sure to call ahead if you want to go visit. Tour Selma is a, an app that was created by A.C. Reeves, who is a Selma-based photographer and artist. Um, she, once again, is just a wealth of knowledge about Black history in, um, so in the Selma area in particular. She knows a lot about um, the Selma to Montgomery marches, like I mentioned, but also all of those little stories, like I said, in between. So get in touch with her if you're interested in visiting Selma. Um, she has several Airbnbs that you can stay in and check out, but she all, she'll also have a lot of really great recommendations for sightseeing and also for birding. She's a birder as well. So she'll have a lot of great recommendations for you if you wanna go visit Selma. And then also I haven't been to the Legacy Museum since uh, the pandemic started, but it is a great resource. If you wanna learn about um, the legacy of slavery up until today um, for black history in Alabama, um, going to go visit the Legacy Museum is a really great option. And from what I understand, they're open right now um, with limited capacity. So go check them out. If you want to learn about the Black Belt today, you can check out um, a couple of books that I recommend. So Visions of the Black Belt is kind of a cultural overview of the Black Belt. And it talks about like music and cooking and art and all that great stuff that the Black Belt has contributed to us. Um, Waste is a book by Katherine Coleman Flowers, who's a recent um, MacArthur Grant recipient. She does um, environmental justice work and she's from Lowndes County. And it's just a really compelling book, um, getting to hear her talk about growing up here and like what compelled her to come back and do the environmental justice work that she does now. Uniontown is a short film about the city of Uniontown, um, also a town that has a lot of environmental injustice issues, unfortunately. Um, and this short film by Fraser Jones is a great way to get just a quick overview of the things that they're struggling with right now. And Hale County This Morning, This Evening is a full length documentary. And, you know, I'm this one is hard to describe. It's just a full day in Hale County. I guess I guess that's the way to describe it. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, it's, it's very impactful, and I highly recommend that you check it out if you want to get a little more context for the Black Belt today in Hill County today. You can rent that one on Amazon Prime. And then just really quickly, I always love to encourage people to go birding. So if you are a brand new birder, something that I found to be really helpful is the Audubon ID app. It's free and you can download it onto your phone to get a really easy way to ID birds because it takes you step by step by asking you questions like how big is the bird? What colors are the bird? Um, how is the bird flying? How is the bird perching? So if you're not familiar with birding and you want to get a little bit of insight on the things that you need to look for when you're going to go bird, that's a really good resource. Once you get your skills up a little bit better, you can join us on eBird. 
and um, help us monitor bird populations throughout the state of Alabama. If you're a book person, you don't want to go birding on your phone, you can get an actual field guide. They'll still exist. <laughs> and the one that we recommend is the Field Guide to the Birds of North America by Nat Geo. It's got great illustrations. It's organized in a really intuitive way. And then finally, I just want to leave you on the fact that you don't have to go anywhere necessarily to go birding, and you don't need to buy anything fancy to go birding. You can go birding at your house or at your work and just look for the birds that are near you. That's what you would start off with. Though if you want to travel to the Black Belt, I welcome that as well. <laughs> Come see us. <laughs> okay, so if you want to learn any more about our Black Belt Birding Initiative, you can go to alaudubon.org slash Black Belt. And if you want to connect with me, you can email me at meg at alaudubon.org. And then lastly, really quickly, if you found any of this interesting, any of our projects, not even just in our Black Belt office interesting, and you want to support us, we are getting, we're in the middle of a car tag drive. So we're trying to get an Alabama Audubon custom tag in production, but we need a thousand pre-commitments in order to make that happen. And this would be a super easy way for you to support us completely for free. You don't have to buy the tag when you pre-commit and you actually don't even have to get the tag in the end from what I understand if you pre-commit. So if you go to alaudubon.org slash tag, you can learn how to sign up for our, um, you can learn how to um, contribute to that 1000 signatures mark that we're um, looking for. And once again, it's totally free um, and it's commitment free as well. So that's it, I believe. Thanks y'all so much. Oh, for yeah. yeah. That sounds um, awesome. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks so much. I actually downloaded the Audubon ID app today because I'm, I'm nice. a recent birder, everyone. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just starting. I'm very new. <laughs> so I'm learning um, yeah. all of these different attributes as well. So I'm, ex I'm excited. It is really, um, it is really handy. So I have experience as a first time birder. You should mm -hmm. download the app. Um, we also have an app here called iNaturalist that kind of does something similar. So, but I, they both are really, really great apps. Also, I saw a flycatcher this morning. So they're at, they, yeah. they're also here at the park. Cool. So, That's awesome. uh, again, we are slowly learning about birding and delving into it. But thank you so much for your talk. Um, also, I know that we have a video about the birding tour. Um, so I don't know if you want to pull that up. I can pull that up for you if you want to talk about that before or. Sure. Do we have time for it? I think it's like a four minute video, maybe. Do we have yeah. time? Yeah. Okay, yeah, go for it. That'd be great. Awesome. So this is a video team tour oh. we're talking about. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say that this is a video of that 2019 Black Belt birding tour that we had at the Joe Farm that I was talking about before. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to our first ever Black Belt Birding Tour. Everybody ready to see kites? Yeah! Sydney Town Whitecasters? Yeah! And ecologically, this region is called the Black Belt Prairie because at one time it, were, it was full of big grasslands because the soils were black and rich in the mid 19th century. And that was both a blessing and a curse because this was the heart of cotton agriculture in the South. It was also the heart of uh, the slave economy. And it really has two different connotations. One's the soil, but it's also where one of the densest African-American populations of the, uh, in Alabama. They're kind of singing tear. That's the indigo bunting thing in that. It's a well-kept secret that I hope will not be a secret much longer. Yeah, I'm here from South Carolina. I drove over just for the, this event, five and a half hours. It's a new landscape and new people. We're bringing an impact to the economy. We just brought 120 people to Greensboro. Most people that live in Birmingham didn't even know the Black Belt existed, and they certainly don't know that it exists to go birding. Partnerships like these with landowners mean that we can get access to uh, the inner parts of properties. First most special thing about the Joe Farm is the Joe family. They're just great people who have welcomed us with open arms. My name is Cornelius Joe. This is our farm. I was raised up here. This is our third generation. And right here we raise Black Angus cattle. We do our own hay. 
Matter of fact, we have a little demonstration set up to get the kite to come out. It means a lot to me that I can take people and bring them to the family land that I've been a part of since I've been born and my father and his father. We have about six miles of trails. Working with this farm will set an example for how small landowners can bring in a little bit of extra business in the form of ecotourism and work with burgers and increase conservation awareness throughout the community. It's actually the first birding trip that I've ever been on. It's just really beautiful and nice to be out in nature. I love it. It's just fantastic to, to be able to connect to the communities, to make it a community effort to help protect their birds. This southern expansion is where it's at. I'm really looking forward to being a part of these efforts that Audubon is making to bring nature and culture together. This is what conservation looks like. That video is so awesome. I think it just sums up all the wonderful work that the Alabama Audubon does. So uh, it's just great. So yeah. thank you guys so much for being here. And well, you guys, I guess that concludes this portion of the virtual component of Bird Fest for today. We hope that you will get outside and look around for birds around your home. And we encourage everyone to visit our West Alabama birding trail destination here at Moundville and make sure you make it down to Greensboro and bird in the black belt as well. Um, and you could also use our birding checklist that we have on our website at moundville.museums.ua.edu. Um, if you're enjoying our virtual content and would like to support us, please consider becoming a member of UA Museums. And you can also uh, contribute to us um, at give.ua.edu forward slash museums. So thank you to everyone who is watching this with us live. And also thank you to all of those who will watch this later. So thanks everybody. Thanks y'all.